The first item of business is members' business debate on motion 10402 in the name of Tom Arthur on eliminating hepatitis C in Scotland, a call to action. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask Tom Arthur to open the debate for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to open this debate on the report Eliminating Hepatitis C in Scotland, a call to action. And I wish to put on record my thanks to all who contributed to the report and to colleagues from across the chamber who signed my motion enabling this afternoon's debate to take place. The report was produced by the Hepatitis C Trust in collaboration with clinicians, support workers, representatives of the pharmaceutical industry and MSPs from each party represented in the Scottish Parliament. As such, it reflects the views of a representative cross-section of those working to treat and eliminate Hepatitis C. The objective of the inquiry, as described in the, in the report, was to map progress towards the Scottish Government's world-leading commitment to Hepatitis C elimination and to develop recommendations to ensure elimination is achieved. In both these areas, the report makes an important and considered contribution to our understanding of both of where we currently stand and where we need to get to if elimination of hepatitis C is to be achieved. Before considering some of the specific recommendations made in the report, I will first seek to give an outline of what hepatitis C is, who it affects, and why elimination is an important public health goal that warrants our attention and continued support. Hepatitis C is a blood-borne virus which, if left untreated, can lead to degeneration of the liver and severe liver disease, potentially resulting in the need for a liver transplant. In Scotland and across the UK, the virus is predominantly spread through the sharing of unsterilised equipment used to inject recreational drugs. Sharing needles for the injection of steroids also presents a risk of transmission as would the use of unsterilised equipment for tattooing, acupuncture or body piercing. Other means of transmission are possible, such as unprotected sex, however are less common. In Scotland, it is estimated that there are 35,000 people who carry the hepatitis C virus, of which 15,000 are thought to be undiagnosed. This compares to an, ex an estimated 6,000 individuals in Scotland who are HIV positive, of whom 800 are believed to be unaware of their status. Presiding officer, in both testing and treatment, there have been significant advances in recent years. Dry blood spot testing offers a simple and accurate way to determine one's hepatitis C status. Treatment is now highly effective, safe, and of a relatively short duration. However, this was not always the case. Prior to the introduction of all oral direct acting antiviral therapies, treating hepatitis C commonly required a long and demanding regime of interferon which was often ineffective and could cause severe and debilitating side effects. Therefore, it was not uncommon for people with hepatitis C to be unable to complete a treatment regime. Indeed, some chose actively not to seek treatment due to the potential of an adverse reaction. This is understandable, particularly, particularly given that many people with hepatitis C are initially asymptomatic. Unfortunately, despite availability of new treatments, many of the fears that dissuaded people from having a test or seeking treatment persist. It's therefore vitally important that we, as individual MSPs and as a parliament, send a clear message. If you think you may have been exposed to hepatitis C at any time in your life or are concerned about your status, please reach out and seek support. This could be to a GP or other health professional or to one of the excellent support charities such as Hepatitis Scotland, the Hepatitis C Trust or Waverley Care. Whatever way you wish to engage and seek support, the important thing to remember is that there is no need to worry in silence. Presiding officer, this first point speaks to the first, this last point I made speaks to the first area of focus in the report, the need to raise awareness. As I've indicated, it's estimated that there are over 40, uh, that over 40 percent of those living with hepatitis C in Scotland do not know their status. Some may suspect and others may have no inclination at all. For those who are concerned that they may have been exposed to hepatitis C, one of the key barriers to testing is stigma. While recognising that stigma has decreased in recent years, the report states that stigma was reported as being still highly prevalent and considered more significant among some groups than the stigma attached to HIV. 
The effect of such stigma can be to prevent individuals from accessing testing for the virus, with some refusing to even consider the idea that they could be infected due to fear of being stigmatised if diagnosed. Presiding officer, this stigma stems directly from the fact that hepatitis C predominantly affects people who have previously or currently inject drugs for recreational use. It therefore reinforces calls to recalibrate thinking on substance misuse and understand it as a public health issue. The, re the report also highlights the need for awareness raising among other less known at-risk groups, such as users of image and performance enhancing drugs, men who have sex with men, a group where awareness of hepatitis C is often lower than awareness of HIV, and the South Asian community, where there is a higher prevalence within the wider population due to the widespread reuse of needles and razors in some South Asian countries. To address these challenge challenges, the report makes a series of recommendations. First, it asks the Scottish Government to investigate the feasibility of a national awareness campaign. Secondly, it calls for high-profile public figures to use World Hepatitis Day, which takes place each year on July 28th, as an opportunity to speak out, publicly highlighting risk factors, the importance of testing and ease of treatment. And thirdly, to target awareness-raising messages to the lesser-known at-risk groups, for examples, in gyms for people who use image and performance and performance-enhancing drugs, in sexual health services for men who have sex with men, and in religious and community centres attended by members of the South Asian community. The report also recommends additional awareness training and support for GPs, particularly given that symptoms associated with hepatitis C can be easily misdiagnosed. Presiding officer, all of these recommendations I've just outlined would have a positive impact upon raising awareness and changing attitudes towards hepatitis C. And they're all recommendations which, in the context of broader public health challenges, would be relatively straightforward to implement. In my remarks concerning the report, I have focused on the issue of awareness. However, the report presents evidence and recommendations on the areas of prevention, testing and diagnosis, linkage to care, access to treatment and funding. I look forward to hearing the thoughts of colleagues from across the chamber on these aspects of the report, and I would strongly encourage anyone who has not yet done so to read the report. Presiding officer, in concluding, I wish to make clear my view and that of all those involved in producing the report, that we have a truly great opportunity in Scotland con to continue to be world leading in the treatment of hepatitis C and achieve elimination by 2030, and perhaps even sooner. We must not let this chance slip from our grasp. Let us redouble our efforts, make elimination a reality, and consign hepatitis C to history. Uh, may I ask all those who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And can I remind members that time is limited for this debate, so it's absolutely essential that you stick to no more than four minutes. And I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Mary Gujion. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by congratulating Tom Arthur on securing today's debate. And as one of the Hep C Trust parliamentary champions, I'm very pleased to contribute today. I thank the Trust for their briefing for today's debate as well. As it, it's, an, it's a very welcome publication of, of the A Call to Action report, which is a really positive and useful piece of work, which makes valuable recommendations around prevention, testing and diagnosis, linkage to care, access to treatment and funding. As Tom Arthur has indicated, it's estimated that around 34,500 of our fellow Scots are chronically infected with hepatitis C, and that more than 40% of these undiagnosed and in too many of these cases, it's been, diagno un been diagnosed, are not connected to treatment services. In 2016, 1,739 people began treatment for hep C, which was slightly less than the previous year. The fact that the rate of incidence amongst people who inject drugs, a key risk group, has risen significantly in recent years, almost doubling between 2011 and 2016, is a real concern. Prevalence also amongst prisoners is especially high with a 2012 study indicating that almost 20% of prisoners were found to have hep C. More recently, the Parliament's Health and Sport Committee undertook an inquiry into prisoner health, which highlighted a number of areas where we are still failing as a country to help identify those infected and look towards treatment pathways. 
And the Scottish Conservatives welcome and do support the Scottish Government's commitment to a sexual health and bloodborne virus framework to eliminate Hep C. But the challenge is now that we develop and then expand the innovative solutions and approaches that will make that a reality in the years ahead, given the current treatment rates that are broadly in line with new cases. Clearly, a step change will be needed if we're to meet the new annual national minimum targets for Hep C treatment initiations of at least 2,000 in this current year, 2,500 in 2019, 3,000 in 2020, and then 3,000 for each sub subsequent year. I know that work is currently being undertaken that will inform and, uh, and eliminate plan, um, which the government has promised uh, to publish later this year. Getting this plan right is vital, and as we seek to extend best practice across all health board areas and roll out successful initiatives to other parts of our country, NHS Tayside, um, which has not had its uh, troubles to seek in recent months, is a leading part of the country in how we can feasibly look to eliminate and meet that target. And so moving forward and moving testing, screening and treatment out of hospitals into a community setting, um, especially within uh, community drugs and alcohol services, will be extremely important and I hope there'll be lessons to learn around that. And I hope in closing this debate uh, this, af this afternoon, the Minister will be able to update Parliament on when the strategy will be unve unveiled and what engagement uh, she and her officials are having with key stakeholders, including patient groups, the third sector providers and pharmaceutical companies involved. I hope this engagement will indeed include close collaboration with Waverley Care in my own region, which has undertaken an important pilot project, which has embedded a community link worker within HMP Barlini in Glasgow to engage and support prisoners with HCV both while in prison and on their release into the community to make sure they get that future care. I also hope the Minister will give details of the funding the Scottish Government will provide to support the elimination plan going forward. Stakeholders are anxious to see budget protect, budgets protected and crucially for the savings arising from the reduced cost of treatments for them to be reinvested into the redesign of services and increased efforts to identify and treat more people with HCV. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again welcome today's debate and the focus it's brought to tackling HCV in Scotland. We have a genuine and rare public health opportunity in Scotland to effectively eliminate a disease and we need to grasp that. We eagerly await the anticipated elimination plan being published and I and other Hep C parliamentary champions and other colleagues across the parliament look forward to both scrutinising the plan and working with the Scottish Government to ensure that it's delivered on the ground in reality. Scotland used to lead the world in our determination to elim eliminate Hep C. It's time that we did again. Can I remind members that they may be disadvantaging colleagues if they go over their time? And may I call Mary Gujion and Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd also like to start by thanking Tom Arthur uh, for bringing this debate and this important topic to the Chamber for discussion. And also for the work that I know he's done, as well as to all the other contributors uh, to the report elimin eliminating hepatitis C in Scotland. And for his role, and I know other part, uh, uh, colleagues' roles as Scottish Parliamentary Champions uh, for Hep C, which uh, from part in we have parliamentary champions across the chamber from all parties today. Now, I read this report with great interest and have followed this work because I, rest in a, I, I represent a constituency, half of which rests within the NHS Tayside area, so I was glad to hear Miles Briggs raise that today. Now, like others in this chamber as elected representatives, we have regular meetings with our local health board. And it, it was when I was uh, attending a meeting with NHS Tayside last year that they gave us a presentation on the work that they'd been undertaking into hepatitis C. And I really found that work just incredible. And that's really why I wanted to speak about that today. Um, because we've already heard, well, Scotland has been considered a global leader in this, uh, in this area. And NHS Tayside has very much been at the forefront of that work. And like I say, NHS Tayside, they've been leading that work and they have been under intense scrutiny of late. Um, and I think that while it, they do have their issues there which need to be resolved, we'll have to give credit where credit is due. And that is particularly to the team who are working on this and recognise what they have achieved so far. And just to give an idea of the impact of this work, Professor John Dillon, who is a consultant he hepatologist at NHS Tayside, stated that the project being undertaken there is on course for Tayside to be the first region in the world to have eliminated HCV. Now that's huge and vitally important. And that's largely due to the pioneering approach that they've taken to tackle the virus, which uses treatment as prevention in the project, testing and treatment of hepatitis C through community pharmacist-led care. 
And this is an approach which has won the team a number of plaudits over the past few years. Now, as has already been outlined, hepatitis C is, is a bloodborne virus which can be contracted in a number of ways, but most commonly through the sharing of needles via intravenous drug use. And the largest single group most affected have been those prescribed opioid replacement therapy. Now, where treatment for hepatitis C previously relied on those who came forward for treatment because they'd either been identified as having used drugs in the past or were accessing other health services, the NHS Tayside project focuses on preventing the spread of the illness by looking to those who are most likely to pass it on, and that is the active drug users. Now, Professor John Dillon attended the Parliament's Health and Sport Committee at the start of the year where he, where he outlined the rationale behind it. He stated, in your career as an injecting drug user, perhaps you inject for several years before moving on to recovery. If you become infected with the virus during that time, you will potentially interact with six or seven other people who you will pass the virus on to. If you can offer treatment at a very early stage, while people who are infected are still actively injecting, when they have contact with other drug users and share equipment with other drug users, their chances of transmiss transmission disappear because they're not infected anymore. It's the idea of treatment as prevention. Now, given that those on opioid replacement therapy received this from a community pharmacist, the team focused on community pharmacies as a mean, means of engaging with patients to access testing and treatment. It's now estimated that around 80% of those with hepatitis C in the Tayside region have been diagnosed, and trans transmission rates, which currently sit at around 5 and 10%, are expected to reduce to just 1% over the coming few years. Now, as it says in the report, hepatitis C is preventable, treatable and curable for the vast majority of people. New treatments are now available with short treatment durations, limited side effects and cure rates upwards of 95%. Scotland is a world leader in this area, but with current testing and treatment rates suggesting that we may not hit the target of elimin eliminating hep C by 2030, we need an elimination strategy. We have the projects that are, work that are working in Scotland, we have the capacity to do it, but we need the focus and strategy to get us there and to help us maintain that world leader status, but more importantly, to actually eliminate the virus itself. Thank you. Call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Deputy Speaker Officer. And I recognise I have a long afternoon in the chamber, so I will not uh, incur your wrath and stay strictly within my, my four minutes. Uh, can I start by thanking, like all the people have, Tom Arthur for bringing forward this important debate, thanking also the Hepsi Trust who have supported all the parliamentary champions and in putting the risk report together. And I want to thank the collaborative and cross-party approach that's been taken uh, in this important work. This is something that unites us across this chamber. And I suppose that is the, uh, the purpose of this debate today, how we can unite behind eliminating Hep C um, in Scotland. I think it's an ambitious um, report. I think it's right that we should try and meet the government's target of eliminating Hep C by 2030. Uh, we have more than 35,000 sufferers uh, of Hep C in Scotland. But at the moment, we're treating less than 10%, far less than 10%. So while I agree with the government's target to eliminate by 2030, I think it's important that we have a full, detailed strategy on how we do that elimination, but also behind that, a deliverable strategy about how we achieve that elimination. And a big part of the challenge is the fact that up to 40% of cases are still undiagnosed in Scotland, and less than one in five people in Scotland um, are receiving the treatment that they need. So finding, testing and then treating patients in locations that are accessible is absolutely essential. Um, particularly because there are issues with substance misuse more generally. So given 90% of Hep C cases are people who are previously injected or are currently injecting drugs, I think how our drug strategy relates to our Hep C strategy is also extremely important. Now this report says that Scotland is falling behind. Um, none of us want Scotland to fall behind. We want Scotland to be the beacon and the pinnacle of eliminating Hep C. And that's why we should look to England and France, who have set targets of 2025, look where there's best practice to learn from, but also where, where we can improve on their strategy so it's actually a deliverable strategy so that we can eliminate Hep C in our own right here um, in Scotland. Um, so um, I noticed the, the time, so we want a, a strategy, a detailed strategy, a deliverable strategy, a strategy that focuses on two areas. Firstly, on finding and diagnosing a greater number of cases working collaboratively with the organisations to find new patients. And then secondly, removing barriers to treatments with clinicians having the freedom to select the most appropriate treatment method. I think it's important to look at how we can partner with prisons um, also in this, because quite often there are 
patients who start treatment or could potentially start treatment who are in our prisons, but because of the length of their sentence, they perhaps fall off that treatment or they don't begin the treatment because there isn't that support base that comes for when they leave prison and what happens in individual communities. So how we have that work collaboratively with our prison service, with our NHS and also with community facilities, I think is absolutely important. And we also know that the cost of treatment has fallen significantly too. So that should encourage us to go even further in terms of being able to treat more people for less money. And we should also recognise that if we do eliminate Hep C, if we do treat people early and we do eradicate Hep C, that actually will provide a net saving to our NHS in terms of all the associated conditions that go together with having Hepatitis C. So I promised I would finish well within my four minutes, Deputy Presiding Officer. I just want to say that we, I hope we can continue that collaborative work and bring forward a meaningful strategy. I hope the Minister can set in more detail what that strategy will look like, when it will be published, what funding will be behind that, and what measurable targets we will have over the course of that strategy to make sure we can test whether it's actually being delivered so we can eradicate Hep C from Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarwar. Um, I call Emma Harper to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to first congratulate my colleague Tom Arthur for bringing this important debate to Chamber today. Mr. Arthur has been very involved as one of the cross party hepatitis C champions that led to the report eliminating hepatitis C in Scotland, a call to action with the Hepatitis C Trust. I would also like to acknowledge the other champions, MSPs Anna Sarwar and Alison Johnson and Miles Briggs, who are in the chamber today, as well as the other champions. The report brings together views of leading clinicians, services, charities and patients who participated in the inquiry. And I thank everyone who is involved in the work. The report isn't lengthy and I would encourage folks across health and social care and wider society to read the report so that everyone can be further informed of ways to tackle and reduce rates of hepatitis C in Scotland. The report's 30 recommendations support proposed work under eight different categories, namely elimination, awareness, prevention, testing and diagnosis, linking to care and accessing treatment and finally funding. These areas are all clearly laid out in the report. In the time I have, I'd like to address the testing, screening and diagnosis aspect of the report. Testing or screening has been done previously using simple blood samples that is tested to look for antibodies to the hep C virus, which is the body's response to exposure to the hep C virus. There is also a PCR test which establishes whether the virus is still active and needs treating. And I note that the dry blood spot testing that Tom Arthur mentioned is now available and NHS and Fries and Galloway offer the dry blood spot test service as well. And it was interesting to read that testing rates have increased in recent years, but the number of persons diagnosed has decreased in 2015 and 2016. This may suggest efforts to find undiagnosed patients may be stalling. I am especially interested in the hard to reach persons most new bloodborne hepatitis C viral infections are the result of sharing or in, of injecting equipment among people who inject drugs. And since problem drug use is a national public health concern, and the chamber recently debated and passed a motion proposing the introduction of an SDCS, which is a safe drug consumption site in Glasgow, the report supports innovative approaches. So I'd like to suggest that SDCS is one of the potential innovative approaches to finding undiagnosed persons. This is action number 16 under the recommendations. And as outlined by the Minister in the previous debate, such places would help reach some of the most marginalised and risk, uh, at risk people in our communities who inject heroin and have potentially shared injection equipment, even once. Even sharing equipment once could lead to hepatitis C um, infection. This would enable the offering of screening and testing leading to diagnosis and then treatment for Hep C. Adequate provision of sterile injecting equipment needs to be made available in places such as community pharmacies and substance misuse services. And the report supports Hep C screening in GP clinics in areas where there is a high Hep C prevalence. Finally, presiding officer, as Tom Arthur has said, and the report states, through a combination of implementing the recommendations, there is an extraordinary and achievable opportunity to eliminate hepatitis C by 2030. 
and I would ask the Scottish Government to analyse the report's recommendations and support the motion. Thank you. Paul Alison Johnson to be followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too would like to thank Tom Arthur for securing this debate. Um, this is absolutely a public health issue, and I am very proud to be a Hepatitis C parliamentary champion. And with colleagues, I strongly believe it is time we did as much as we possibly can, much more, to diagnose and to treat people. It's thought, as we've heard, that around 45% of people in Scotland with Hepatitis C aren't even diagnosed, and that isn't acceptable not when treatment is so effective and can play such an important role in prevention. I too would like to thank all the experts who've taken part in hepatitis C um, meetings, who've contributed evidence to this report, which is indeed a call for action, an action now. And I'd particularly like to thank those patients who've shared their experiences with us. And I'd like to share my sincere admiration for the, the incredible work the Edinburgh access practice does to diagnose, treat and care for people with hepatitis C. Um, by building fabulous relationships, really strong relationships between staff and patients with the help of their fantastic outreach specialist, they're able to get people the diagnosis and treatment they need in a setting that suits them. Um, I learned that this specialist even knows which sofa a patient is sleeping on on a particular night of the week. Um, that is what I call outreach. And I think that's really important. You know, we hear, we often hear a lot about treating people who are hard to reach. I understand why people use that phrase. I'm sure I've used it in the past myself, probably too often. But I'm reminded today that people aren't hard to reach. It's our services that can be hard to reach. Stigma is still a barrier. And some people who are not diagnosed have many other complications in their lives. And I'll never forget meeting a patient at the Edinburgh Access Practice who, their joy at recovery, um, they told me that they now felt clean and the clear impact this had on their mental health and well-being and the feeling that they did have a, a productive life ahead of them. You know, I, it's really important. I think we can't underestimate the opportunity we have to make that difference to, to, to many more people in Scotland. You know, when the Health and Sport Committee heard evidence on treating bloodborne viruses, we were told time and time again that we need to get out into community settings to make sure people are diagnosed and treated. Um, and we've heard too from, from Tom Arthur and colleagues that previously treatment was so notoriously debilitating, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty scary and off-putting and it would be avoided, but we've come a long way um, since then. So the more people that we can diagnose and treat, the better. And it's not long since we had an important debate on the need for safe drug consumption facilities in this chamber. These facilities would provide another opportunity to test and treat people. And when I pre prepared for that debate, I read NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's report taking away the chaos. And I was really alarmed when, it, when I read that people who injected drugs considered hepatitis C ubiquitous and therefore inevitable. So sharing communal batches of drugs or needles stored at public injection locations was commonplace. We do need safe drug consumption facilities to reduce new cases of hepatitis C and treat those who already have it. Um, Dr Ken Oates raised a point at Health and Sport Committee which we would do well to consider today. He suggested that while there will always be diverse views on ring fencing, some protected funding can be of real benefit to vulnerable people. Um, and he gave the example of funding streams for alcohol and drugs partnerships. Um, Anna Sarwar is right, prison testing rates remain too low. We should have an opt-out basis for testing there. Um, and when people are released from prison, that treatment should follow them where it has started. I really do think Parliament has a fabulous opportunity here. I associate myself with Mary Goujon's comments. In my view, the NHS Tayside treatment model should be rolled out as quickly as possible. Presiding officer, we have already made a commitment to eliminate hepatitis C in Scotland. That's achievable. This is an area where Scotland could easily be leading. Let's lead, and I look forward to hearing from the minister how Scotland is going to take action now to eliminate hepatitis C. Thank you. The last two uh, open debate contributions are from Ivan McKee, followed by Brian Whittle. <coughs> thank you, and presiding officer, I would like to take this opportunity, as members have done, to thank Tom Arthur for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today and to all those involved in the preparation of the Hepatitis C Trust Report. Presiding officer, it's not often that we have the opportunity to eradicate a disease in its entirety. 
But today we're debating the possibility to do just that. If the correct steps are taken over the coming period, Scotland could be at the forefront of the global, global efforts to eliminate Hep C, making a huge difference to the lives of thousands of individuals and their families, current sufferers and those yet to be diagnosed or to contract the disease. And in addition, elimination would save the health service many millions currently spent on treatment and care that could be diverted into other priorities. There's much talk in healthcare of the preventative agenda, the concept that spending extra money now results in lower costs to the system later. Often the problem with executing on preventative spend opportunities is the difficulty in understanding and demonstrating the link between the extra upfront spend and the consequent savings, which often, for many reasons, do not materialise as anticipated. However, in the case of Hep C elimination, the relationship is much more clear cut. Every year, a number of cases are treated, and while new medicines have significantly reduced the cost to treat, the total spend is still high. Increases in treatment rates delivered now will result in lower rates of incident going forward. The numbers can be modelled and the resulting future costs of treatment in both scenarios evaluated. Over and above the savings from lower future treatment costs for the condition itself are the savings in costs of consequent conditions, for example, liver disease and care. Often preventative health measures can actually exacerbate health inequalities with the middle classes listening to healthy lifestyle messages and acting accordingly. However, the elimination of HCV, however, will actually serve to reduce health inequalities as it often affects vulnerable and deprived groups in society. I would also like to take this opportunity to raise awareness of the work being undertaken by Waverly Care and Abve in Berlin Prison in my own Glasgow Province constituency, a project that I have visited and witnessed at first hand. The prevalence of hepatitis C amongst the prison population is estimated as high as 19%. As part of the project, a community link worker is embedded in the prison. They engage with and support prisoners with a hep C diagnosis whilst in prison and upon liberation into the community. This ensures there is continuity of care and that the individual is not lost to the system as is often the case otherwise. The pilot has proven successful and has now been extended to other prisons. The report makes proposals for inclusion in a Scottish Government implementation plan for elimination of the disease. This plan needs to provide robust modelling of the numbers required to be treated on an annual basis to reduce infection rates to the point where elimination is achievable. It also needs to model the financial impact, how much money is to be spent each year and for how many years to increase treatment levels and how much that will save in the long run. It has been estimated that elimination can be achieved within the existing budgets for Hep C, but it will require a different approach. Adopting flexible budget models that support NHS boards to deliver multi-year budget plans and having ring-fenced budgets for Hep C with a minimum rather than a fixed treatment target. Negotiations with drug suppliers for a fixed cost for elimination over a given period could dramatically reduce cost per treatment. And there needs to be a whole system approach to ensuring that implementation and funding is coordinated at a Scottish level and that savings achieved are monitored and then reinvested to accelerate the elimination process. By taking these steps, I believe we can look forward to the day when hepatitis C has been eliminated in Scotland. Thank you. And the final open debate speaker is Brian Whittle. <laughs> I can see you're really, really, really keen to respond, Minister. <laughs> Brian, start there. <laughs> Brian Whittle. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I add uh, my thanks to Tom Arthur for bringing this debate to the Chamber and the work he has undertaken, uh, another MSPs like Miles Biggs, Alex Cole, Hamilton, Alison Johnson, Anna Sawa, to highlight the cause uh, of eliminating hepatitis C. I also wanted to add my congratulations to uh, Hepatitis C Trust for their, their report, A Call to Action, which both highlights the challenges facing us as we work to eliminate Hep C in Scotland and shows how we can get there. And aiming to eliminate any disease uh, is a big ambition, but as we see in this report, it is achievable not by a single grand gesture or proclamation, but through targeted interventions backed up by a political will from this place. And I wanted to, as has already been mentioned in here, that the uh, Health and Support Committee have done quite a lot of work uh, in this area and heard uh, exactly what was talked about by Marie Goujon uh, in, in uh, the Tayside application, the way they are looking to eliminate, uh, eliminate Hep C up there. And also it was raised within uh, the debate in this chamber when we discussed uh, uh, safe injection houses, as, as Alison Johnson mentioned. So that, um, uh, the, the chamber has, has, is prepared to stand up 
and debate some really hard, hard topics, and I think this, this is one of them. And it's clear from this report that, that one of the biggest uh, obstacles in elim eliminating, hep C, eliminating Hep C is in the area of diagnosis, particularly early diagnosis, because people infected with Hep C can show few or no symptoms for years. It's more difficult to detect the virus before it causes serious liver damage. That also, of course, increases the risk of people unknowingly spreading the virus uh, to others, as, as has been mentioned today. The majority of new Hep C infections result from intravenous drug users sharing injection equipment. Many of the contributors to this report felt that the best way to address this was through preventing, preventing drug taking in the first place through supporting opioid substitution therapies uh, such as methadone. And I think, again, we've had that debate in here, and I think that uh, I'd just like to, to caveat that by saying that methadone in itself I don't think is, is the solution, but certainly part of a much bigger solution. I think the importance of raising awareness and providing opportunities for testing. And when we're discussing uh, prevention, I think the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, awareness programs in, in prisons and in substance misuse services is, a re is really key because, again, when, when the uh, uh, Health and Sport Committee were out in the, in the communities discussing this particular, uh, looking, at, looking at drug use, it was very obvious then that the, the most effective way uh, of, of uh, persuading people from uh, taking, uh, taking the drug, uh, injecting drugs was peer-to-peer. -peer. So I think that's a really important uh, that that, that uh, uh, service continues. Also highlighting, highlighting the lack of symptoms to encourage people who may have in the past engaged in, in this a behaviour which could put them at risk of having the condition is really important. And this, this debate is part of that. I think in testing and diagnosis, I think the report identifies a fall in the number of patients being diagnosed in 2015 and 16 despite increasing testing rates. And I think that only emphasizes the need to ensure that testing is being uh, targeted effectively. And we, and we know where to look for that. Clearly, one of the biggest opportunities for testing comes when drug users visit needle exchanges or addiction support services. And I would like to hear from the Minister how the Scottish Government uh, are look, going to look to continue that kind of support. Uh, I think that the... the, the um, Sorry, the, uh, however, it can only be a viable option if we combine this with uh, awareness programmes which seek to normalise testing and ensure that no one is put off these services as a result. I think stigma has been mentioned several times within here, uh, within this chamber. I think, uh, the la lastly, I'd like to address the need for the barriers to testing to be brought down. I think the need for more testing in non-clinical settings where staff have a strong personal relationship with clients can actually be a better place to encourage them to be tested and support them in the event of a positive diagnosis, as, as Alison Johnson highlighted. You so, must so close, officer, I'm going to sit down at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. <laughs> and uh, I call Aileen Campbell. Uh, seven minutes, please, Minister. No more than that. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Now, like others, uh, thank my colleague Tom Arthur for bringing this important matter to the chamber. It has provided us with an opportunity to reflect on Scotland's track record in tackling uh, Hep C, uh, to respond directly to some of the recommendations of the Hep C Trust, Hepatitis C Trust report, and to outline for me to outline the government's strategy to eliminate Hep C as a public health concern in Scotland, which is very much in line with today's uh, motion. Over the last decade, Scotland really has been at the forefront of efforts to tackle Hepatitis C. In fact, this is recognised in the Hepatitis C Trust report, which recognises that Scotland has long been regarded as a world leader in tackling Hepatitis C. Indeed, Scotland's Hepatitis Action Plan was a model that informed the World Health Organisation's approach to national action plans for viral hepatitis. And a Scottish NHS expert was seconded to the uh, World Health Organisation to help them develop their thinking on this. And this directly led to the first ever World Hepatitis Summit being jointly hosted by Scottish Government and the World Health Organisation in Glasgow in 2015. And it was also in 2015 that we announced our intention to eliminate hepatitis C as a public health concern. And that intention and ambition is something this government remains committed to. Hepatitis C disproportionately impacts on some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland. But it is a disease that can be cured and effectively prevented, and that means we can eliminate it. A point forcibly made uh, by Mary uh, Goujon. 
Indeed, uh, in response to Marie Goujon and others who, uh, who raised the work in NHS Tayside, I'll be visiting NHS Tayside on Tuesday and meeting with Professor John Dillon and other professionals involved in that board's leading work. Uh, and we'll be able to kind of understand uh, a bit more what learning we can share and uh, replicate uh, as we work on this issue. And looking to the recommendations, though, of the Hepatitis C Trust report, I recognise that there is a, a clear desire for a strategy to eliminate Hepatitis C infection in Scotland. And our current focus is on eliminating the serious disease associated with the virus. And we have seen real progress with that. And I've recently asked uh, Health Protection Scotland to provide recommendations on how we might eliminate uh, the virus. And on receipt of this uh, advice, I will make sure that members are updated as that work continues to progress. In the meantime, in January of this year, I increased the annual treatment targets for hepatitis C to 2,000 per year for 2018-19. And we will keep them under review over the coming years. But I think it is important to recognise that this figure represents the minimum number of patients who should be treated. I know others mentioned that in this afternoon, but that is not a cap. That is the minimum that we expect to be uh, treated. Uh, and we'll keep that figure under review because we are treating more people and we are treating them successfully but we also must increase treatment capacity in a safe and sustainable way to, in order to keep us on track to do the good work that we are all celebrating uh, today. Now I agree with Hepatitis C Trust Report's emphasis on the importance of combating stigma around Hep C and Tom Arthur eloquently articulated the barriers, concerns and fears surrounding the stigma associated with Hepatitis C. In the 2015 update to the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Framework, the government reconfirmed its commitment to tackling stigma and the negative attitudes towards those affected by bloodborne viruses. And that's why we're providing 1.9 million over the next three years to third sector organisations to support innovative work to tackle sexual health uh, challenges and reduce bloodborne virus transmission. And that includes work to challenge the stigma and activities that specifically target the most at risk groups such as vulnerable young people and those who inject uh, drugs. I think members also re recognise the recommendations around awareness. Uh, in response to some of that, the Scottish Government is actively considering the feasibility of a national awareness campaign and funding has also been given to Hepatitis Scotland to lead national awareness raising activity and to do work in raising awareness among professionals, uh, including uh, general practitioners. So I hope that gives some comfort that we are actively going through the recommendations from the Trust and where we can uh, and where it's feasible, we'll consider the uh, recommendations fully and make sure we act uh, upon them. The report also uh, notes uh, that prevention measures are a crucial uh, element of any elimination strategy and I wholeheartedly agree with that point. As we know, these infections are primarily passed via injecting drug use. So it's crucial that we tailor our support and interventions to that vulnerable and com complex group. And we're funding third sector colleagues to better understand this population's specific needs by engaging directly uh, with them. And Miles Briggs, Anna Sarver and Ivan Key absolutely correctly mentioned concerns around prison. And I've also witnessed some of that great work that has been uh, undertaken through Waverley Care at Barlinney uh, and the support given to prisoners who uh, face uh, incredible challenges that we still have uh, an awful lot of good work that's going on, but we still have an awful lot to overcome. Of course, we'll continue to work with Waverley Care uh, to understand what more we can learn from that as that work progresses. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for taking this intervention. We've heard um, throughout the debate today, the progress which has been made in NHS Tayside. I'd be interested to hear how's that been rolled out across other health bo boards and what learning they can take f from what's happened in NHS Tayside to date. Aileen Campbell. I'm visiting NHS Tayside on this uh, on Tuesday to make sure that we can properly understand the, the good work that's going on. It's worth pointing out that this morning I was uh, at the, uh, our National Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Advisory Committee uh, meeting, which has a uh, representatives from uh, David Goldberg and who has given us a pre presentation on the work that's been happening uh, across the country specifically citing the work in NHS Tayside and of course that work uh, that group is populated also by I forget her name though but it's people from NHS Tayside who are continuing to make sure that we understand the work that's going on there to ensure that we can through their advice to me that we can understand that and make sure that that can be effectively uh, taken forward uh, in other parts of uh, the country. So others have mentioned the issues around the uh, work that is being taken by Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership around the safe consumption uh, rooms and that's absolutely uh, why uh, we need to ensure that 
the work that is going on around Hep C absolutely is complemented by the work that we're taking forward around uh, the substance misuse strategy. I think a point raised, I, th I think, by Anna Sarwar, are making sure things are complementing one another. But I think it's important, presiding officer, to recognise that we are building this work on a from a position of strength. Uh, recently, for example, Scotland was recognised at the 2018 International Liver Congress for the success that we've had in reducing serious Hep C related liver disease. Health Protection Scotland data shows that we've delivered a 39% reduction between 2013 and 16 in the incidence of you decompensated close, cirrhosis please. in those with chronic Hep C. A clear indication that our approach of targeting those most unwell is working. So, again, congratulate all the members for speaking and we'll look forward to continuing. This Thank you, work. Minister. That concludes the debate and we now move on to the next item of business.